Good morning. It's good to see you all, especially those visiting with us. You'll see many of our number back with us. Good to see the Hewlett's not only safely back from Oklahoma, but also healed up from COVID and Myoma, who hasn't been here in a while. We're so pleased to see her and so many others who are joining us today. And it's, it's good to see these, these familiar faces. If you want to open your Bibles, we'll be starting in Romans 15 and verse 4. Romans 15 and verse 4. You know, in our daily Bible reading, if you've been following along with that, we've been working our way through the accounts of First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles. I know sometimes the you have to go back and forth between those two books to get the whole picture of everything that's happening. Uh, but these books are a source of of great study for the Christian. This is Paul tells us in Romans 15 and verse four. He says, "For whatever was written in earlier times." was written for our instruction. So that through the perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. But sometimes when we approach the Old Testament, we think, well, what is the point of me reading this? I'm not underneath the old law. I, I, this, this isn't my people. This isn't, didn't happen. This isn't my history. This has no pertinence to me. Um, that could be farther, from, that couldn't be farther from the truth. The whole Bible, cover to cover, is God's truth. And the whole Bible, as Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy, is inspired by God and is profitable for training in righteousness, for correction, for reproof, and so forth. That means even in the Old Testament, there are principles and precepts and lessons that we can learn from and make application to our own life. So as we were working through 2 Chronicles a couple weeks ago, you know, I, you had my, every time I read through the Bible, something new gets illustrated to me, or a new lesson gets presented. There's a theme. A couple of years ago, when I read through the Bible again, I was struck how every single king in Israel, and I mean the northern kingdoms, was likened to Jeroboam. And every time, without fail, the chronicler, uh, the guy who wrote First and Second Kings, is different from who wrote First and Second Chronicles. And they're, written, they're writing at two different periods of time. Chronicles is written after captivity. They both say, by the way, Jeroboam, who made Israel sin by making the idol. That's Brendan's paraphrase there. I thought, wow, how bad do I have to mess up to where God inspires that every single time my name gets brought up? That's... First time I read through the Bible in one year, I was struck with how much grace there is in the law of Moses. There's so many provisions for if you accidentally were unclean during the Passover, well, you can make it up. Or if you have an unintentional sin, well, here's the offering to do that. God had all these provisions. And what struck me this time when reading through the life of King Asa, I'm like, wow, I get to chapter 14. I'm like, cool, we're starting pretty good. His dad, uh, his dad Abijah, he was kind of in the middle, not the best, not the best king. I'm like, okay, cool, Asa, we're starting out pretty strong, we're moving idols. That's great. I get to chapter 15, I'm like, cool. He gets a word from God. He gets, he, God tells him, you're doing great. Keep doing good. So I thought, oh, sweet. This is, this is going to keep going. Then I scratched my head, I'm like, why are we making an alliance with Israel? In chapter 16. Why are we aligning ourselves with Ahab? The worst of the worst. And then we get to the rebuke from the prophet. And I had kind of just stopped after reading, like, how could somebody who started so good end so poorly? But they said at the end of his life, when he's afflicted with severe illness in his feet, the text tells us explicitly in verse 12 of 2 Chronicles 16, yet even in his disease, he did not seek the Lord but the physicians. It was severe. I don't know about you, but foot pain is not fun. I mean, last week I stubbed my pinky toe so hard it turned black. It wasn't broken, at least I don't think it was broken. It was annoying. 
They are morning when I woke up. Somehow both my legs were asleep, so I went to go stand up. Well, I wasn't standing up for long. Uh, foot pain is not fun. And yet in his distress, this severe illness, like, nope, not going to do it. Not going to ask God for forgiveness. Not going to ask God for help. Not going to ask God for healing. And so this morning when we look at the life of King Asa, I've kind of just given you the overview here. We want to ask the question, you know, where's the encouragement? Where's the hope? What is the lesson or lessons that God is teaching us through the life of King Asa because he preserved the life of King Asa for our instruction. And so we want to start in first Chron- second Chronicles, excuse me, chapter four, 14, starting in verse 1. We begin with the death of his father. So Abijah slept with his fathers, and they buried him in the city of David, and his son Asa became king in his place. The land was undisturbed for ten years during his days. I'm reading from the New American Standard translation here. Verse 2. Asa did good and right in the sight of the Lord his God. For he removed the foreign altars and the high places, tore down the sacred pillars, and cut down the Asherim, and commanded Judah to seek the Lord God of their fathers, and to observe the law and the commandment. He also removed the high places and the incense altars from all the cities of Judah, and the kingdom was undisturbed under him. He built fortified cities in Judah, since the land was undisturbed, and there was no one at war with him during those years, because the Lord had given him rest. For he said to Judah, let us, build, let us build these cities surrounding them with walls and towers and gates and bars. The land is still ours, because we have sought the Lord our God. We have sought him, and he has given us rest on every side. So they built up and prospered. Now Asa had an army of 300,000 from Judah, bearing large shields and spears, and 280,000 from Benjamin, bearing shields and wielding bows, and all of them were valiant warriors. We're going to pause there for just a moment. I was tempted to name this point Asa done good, but I don't think that was the most proper English out there. But that's the gist. That's the gist of what happened, right? It's also a reason why Brendan will never do his own translation of the New Testament. <laughs> It, it won't be good. But Asa did good. That's what the text tells us. And it's not good by Asa's own definition. He's not trying to feel his way to what is the good. He did good in the sight, and right in the sight of the Lord his God. Well, what does that include? Well, we look through the text. The very first thing he does is he removes the high places, tears down the sacred pillars, and cut down the ashram. Now, the Asherim or Asherah, depending on the chronicle or king account, was the, was the companion deity to Baal. She was the Canaanite goddess of fertility. And Baal also would gift that occasionally. And according to Canaanite religion, those two had a thing. And I'm going to leave it at that. And you would sacrifice, oddly enough, your child to Baal, so Asherah would give you blessings of fertility. It, 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 it's a convoluted system. But these are the two pagan gods that Israel, as God would say so many times in the prophets, would play the harlot with. And so Asa's first act is, we're getting rid of that. We're getting rid of the sacred poles, we're tearing down the high places, all of it. In verse 5, it's not only that, he removed the high places and the incense altars from all the cities of Judah. It's not just Jerusalem he's sending these things right. He's sending out people throughout all his kingdom. We're done with this. Second thing he does in verse 4. He commanded Judah to seek the Lord God of their fathers and observe the law and the commandment. Wow. He's not suggesting they do this. Text tells us he's commanding that they do this. Why? Because they're in covenant with God and they're backing out of their side of the covenant. They're not doing what their end of the covenant demands them to do. That is to seek the Lord their God with all their heart, all their soul, and all their mind in Deuteronomy 6 there. Now imagine if a president of the United States on its inaugural address, that whole inaugural address is basically a sermon. Convicting the nation of the collective wickedness, and then right after that saying, we all ought to serve the Lord our God. That'd be something, wouldn't it? Kind of refreshing, maybe. We talked about last week about President Garfield. Only 
only Christian to ever be president in the true New Testament biblical sense. It was a different time, though. But here we have a new king. Again, God used Abijah for his own purposes, but Abijah's record is less than stellar. But we, here we get Asa, and somewhere along the line, Asa was brought up with the fear of the Lord. A fear, a, a fear and a knowledge of God enough to know what was right and what was wrong, and now this was not tolerated. And because of that, because he sought the Lord and the nation sought the Lord, God blesses them and they prospered. You might be wondering, well, why, why is it talking about why, are we, why, why do we have the recording of he built the fortified cities in Judah? Because the build fortification costs money and a ton of it. Metal bars, ramparts, walls. He's walling off cities. They were prospering. And even better, they were undisturbed from war for the first 10 years of Asa's reign. But then we get to the first crisis of his reign. Verses 8 through 10. And we already read, read verse 8, but verses 9 and 10. Now Zerah, the Ethiopian, came out against them with an army of a million men and 300 chariots. And he came to Meshra. So Asa went out to meet him. And they drew up in the battle formation in the valley of Zephathai at uh, Meshra. Then Asa called to the Lord his God. Excuse me. I gave away what's going to happen. But first crisis. Commander of the Ethiopians or the ancient, what your, uh, your translation may say, the kingdom of Cush. It's the ancient name for it. That's how the Romans and the ancient peoples knew of this kingdom. It's modern day Ethiopia. This is where most of the world's gold was coming from at this time in the Western Hemisphere. It was a powerful nation. Egypt wouldn't even mess with them. And yet, unlike other kings of Judah or Israel, this is unprovoked. You know, you look at some of the last kings, they just, like the little, little chihuahua trying to like pick a fight with a giant pit bull. That's how some of the later kings did with Assyria and Babylon. It's like, hey, we can, we can, bite, we can fight you. We can beat you. No, you can't. And Judah right here, they're outnumbered. I love how the chronicler records this. He's like, oh yeah, he had a million man army. Oh, <laughs> and I forgot, 300 chariots too. 300 chariots alone would be a hassle to deal with. But here we got 1 million uh, men and 300 chariots. Now, I'm not good at math, but I know enough that Asa is what we would call licked. He's outnumbered. So what's he going to do? What's the only thing he can do? Let's continue on. Then Asa called to the Lord his God and said, Lord, there was no one besides you to help in the battle between the powerful and those who have no strength. So help us, O Lord, our God, for we trust in you, and in your name we have come against this multitude. O Lord, you are our God, let not man prevail against you. So the Lord routed the Ethiopians before Asa and before Judah, and the Ethiopians fled. Now, the rest of the chapter basically talks about how the Judean army followed them and pursued them until they were utterly destroyed. But Asa did what the rulers of God's people in this time always should have done. Not trying to come up with alliances, not seeing who we can pay off to maybe get their army to come help us. They besought the Lord their God. And you look at the language of Asa's prayer here in verse 11. Such a short prayer, but so dense and impactful and powerful. He understands there is no one that can help them but God. That's what he says in the beginning. And he also understands that this battle is not between Judah and Ethiopia, two regional powers trying to vie for who domination. It's between God and his enemies. It's between this people defacing the people of God and God upholding his name. Asa understood that. And so because Asa and the people showed such utter reliance and, de and depend dependence upon God, he answered their prayer. He routed the Ethiopians. They were outnumbered, a little over two to one. And they won. Asa started out right, 
And we'll talk more about that at the end of the lesson when we draw our applications. But then we go into the next big section in Asa's life here. How Asa not only did right, but he knew how to listen well. In chapter 15, we begin with an oracle coming to Azariah, the prophet. Verses 1 through 7. Now the Spirit of God came upon Azariah, the son of Obed, and he went out to meet Asa and said to him, Listen to me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you when you are with him, and if you seek him, he will let you find him. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. For many days Israel was without the true God, and without a teaching priest, and without law. But in their distress they turned to the Lord God of Israel, and they sought him, and he let them find him. In those times there was no peace to, to him who went out or to him who came in, for many disturbances afflicted all the inhabitants of the land. Nation was crushed by nation, and city by city, for God troubled them with every kind of distress. But you be strong, and do not lose courage, for there is reward for your work. How encouraging, how comforting, whatever word you want to use, to not only have gone from, and we, we can only infer what happened in Asa's upbringing, why he turned out this way. I think his character points to enough that there was some good influence in his life. But we begin with him, on a very rudimentary level, just purging the land from everyone but Yahweh, all the idols and high places and so forth. And he had enough faith to know that when he was outnumbered, he called upon God and he saw in a very real way the Lord's deliverance and his salvation. There's a picture of salvation here, too, for the Christian, because you know, we were severely outgunned and outnumbered, and there was no hope for us. It was only by the grace of God that we were saved. And it's only by God's grace here back in the Old Testament that Asa and the nation was saved, for he appealed to God. Now, as a reward for this, God sends him a word through the prophet. And basically the word is, Whenever you are with me, I am with you. And the warning, which is still today, if you forsake me, I'll forsake you. It kind of reminds me of what Jesus said in Matthew 10, 32 and 33, right? If you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father who is in heaven. If you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father who is in heaven. And the prophet reviews the history of Israel that for a long time they were without true God, without teaching, without the priest, without the law. And when they finally sought the Lord, there was peace. There was no peace for the other nations, but there was peace for Israel. So what does Asa do? Verse 8, when now when Asa heard these words of the prophecy, which Azariah, the son of Obed, the prophet spoke, he took courage and removed the abominable idols from all the land of Judah and Benjamin and from the cities which he had captured in the hill country of Ephraim. He then restored the altar of the Lord, which was in front of the porch of the Lord, before he moved further. It seems at this time that he had expanded the kingdom a little bit, recaptured some of the northern territory. And so not only do we see another purging of the land from the idols, but we're qualified with this, the abominable idols. The things that are particularly distasteful and that the Lord detests. I mean, he detests all idols, but he really had it out, rightfully so, for Baal and, and the idols that would encourage gross and lewd um, immorality. And not only that, he's doing it in the new lands he's taken from Ephraim, one of the tribes of the northern kingdom. And he restores the altar of the Lord. Now let's think about that for just a moment. It shows that also the priest didn't kind of had lost some understanding, right? Because if the altar is destroyed or in disrepair, what can't happen? Sacrifices. Which means on the Passover, the Day of Atonement, there's nothing to sacrifice the Passover lamb on. There's nothing to sacrifice your individual sin offerings on. In a very real way, thank God that Asa sought the Lord with all his heart. And thank God that he was given an oracle that he would know this is what I need to do. So they restore the altar. And not only this, they offer a great sacrifice. Let's continue on. 
He gathered all Judah and Benjamin and those from Ephraim, Manasseh, and Simeon who reside with them, for many defected to him from Israel when they saw that the Lord his God was with him. So they assembled at Jerusalem in the third month, the 15th year of Asa's reign. So we're told it's about five years after the event of the Ethiopians. Does that happen in the 10th year? Or at least 10 years Israel or Judah saw no war. So we're here about five years later. And it was clear from that event that the Lord was with Judah. And we should take courage that not everyone in the northern kingdom was a reprobate. Some saw that God was with Judah and said, you know what? Ahab, I'm out of here. Yahweh is with Judah. I'm going to Judah. Renounce their citizenship, their nationality, whatever you want to call it, their tribal affiliation to go to Judah. Now, they still had the family lineage. And in a, very, in a, in a sense, that Asus kind of has a representative reunified Israel here in his, in his borders. It's not all the tribes, but there's representation from both northern and southern now in one kingdom. And they sacrificed a great sacrifice in verse 11. They, they, on that day, they sacrificed 700 oxen, 7,000 sheep from the spoil they had brought. Verse 12. They entered into the covenant to seek the Lord of their, God of their fathers with all their heart and all their soul. And whoever would not seek the Lord God of Israel should be put to death, whether small or great, man or woman. Moreover, they made an oath to the Lord with a loud voice when shouting with trumpets and with horns. And all Judah rejoiced concerning the oath, for they had sworn with their whole heart and had sought him earnestly, and he let them find him. So the Lord gave them rest on every side. They were already in the Mosaical Covenant, but we see throughout Israel's history they take additional covenants when they renew their loyalty to their God. They had come out of a period of disloyalty, of idolatry, and they're now coming, they're in a period now where they're seeking God with all their heart, all their soul, all their mind. And the people are rejoicing greatly over this. The altar's restored. I mean, we see similar pictures in Ezra and Nehemiah when they rebuild the temple. They're excited. And Asa has his faith strengthened to such a point now where he can make a hard decision about a certain family member. Um, very briefly, 16 through 18, he removes his mother from the position of queen mother. And verse, end of verse 16, because she, because she had made a horrid image of an Asherah, and Asa cut down that horrid image, crushed it, and burned it, burned it in the brook of Kidron, but the high places were not removed from Israel. Nevertheless, Israel, Asa's heart was blameless all his days. It seems that he gave the order to remove it all throughout Judah, but there was some lagging behind, at least a little bit. But the chronicler is very quick to tell us that why some of the people may have failed to tear down the high places, Asa is not to blame. That he remained blameless before the Lord his God all in that text there, at least at this point. I mean, this is, it's not very often in Israel's history do we see that the nation comes back to God with renewed strength and renewed faith and with renewed zeal. So, so far, we're 15 years into the reign. We're getting rid of idolatry. We're serving God. We're restoring the temple. We have prophets speaking to us again. This is great. So now we fast forward towards the end of the reign. And unfortunately, Asa failed to end his life well. About 20 years later, in the 36th year, verse, six, uh, verse 1 of chapter 16, in the 36th year of Asa's reign, Baasha, king of Israel, came against Judah and fortified Ramah in order to prevent anyone from going out or coming into Asa, king of Judah. Two things here. One, lies the northern tribe attacking their brethren to the south of them. It's what Israel does. I mean, there might be a better reason than that, but when you study Israelite history, every couple of years, when Judah gets a bad king, you're like, I'm going to retake Israel. 
And when Israel king gets bold enough, he's like, I'm going to retake Judah. And it never happens. And so they spill brother's blood for no purpose other than them trying to amass more power for themselves. God always seems to intervene and knock them back in their place. Secondly, of this verse, note the motivation why Baasha is doing this. Prevent anyone from going out or coming in to Asa, king of Judah. It seems that defections were more regular during this time period because these people in the northern kingdom saw what was going on in the southern kingdom and like, hey, we want to be with God. God's not here. I'm out. And Baish is not liking that. So, you know, ten northern tribes, two southern tribes were outnumbered again. Israel, because they don't care about their covenant with God, they've made allies with all sorts of people in the region. They can call upon all sorts of power. So what's Asa going to do? Now, if we were reading for the first time, and I'm blocking off the rest of the chapter, and I just read verse 1, based on everything else I've just read, I would think, okay, maybe Asa's going to call on God again. Maybe we'll do what we did with the Ethiopians. No, that's not what we see. Picking up in verse 2, when Asa brought out silver and gold from the treasuries of the house of the Lord and the king's house and sent them to Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, who lived in Damascus, saying, Excuse me. Verse 3, let, us th- let there be a treaty between you and me as between my father and your father. Behold, I have sent you silver and gold. Break your tre- treaty with Basha, king of Israel, so he will withdraw from me. So Ben-Hadad listened to King Asa and sent the commanders of his armies against the cities of Israel, and they conquered Ejon, Dan, abel Maim, and all the store cities of Naphtali. When Baasha heard of it, he ceased fortifying Ramah and stopped his work. Then King Asa brought all Judah, and they carried away the stones at Ramah and its timber, which Baasha had been building uh, with them, and he fortified Gibeah and Mitzpah. So we have an issue. Judah's outnumbered. So what are we going to do about it? Well... Within this people's record memory, they could have appealed to God like they did with the Ethiopians. Asa does not do that. He robs all the prosperity that God had given them to pay off the king of Aram so he'll break his treaty with Israel and start attacking them. It's kind of like in World War II where Hitler thought he had it all good. Everyone's fallen before me in Western Europe. The Brits are going to be beaten in just a couple months. I have a great idea. Let's invade the Soviet Union in winter. And they became a two-front war. And that was all the Allies needed to start building up troops and turn the tide. And this is what's happening here. Judah knows they can't beat them alone. So they thought of human racing, well, let's pay off one of their allies to break the treaty and attack them. Let's open up a two-front war. And this seems by human reasoning, without reading into verse 7, without reading into verse 7, by human reasoning, this seems pretty smart. But we have another prophet. Verse 7, at that time, Hanani, the seer, came to Asa, king of Judah, and said to him, Because you have relied on King Aram, and have not relied on the Lord your God, therefore the army of the king of Aram has escaped out of your hand. Were not the Ethiopians and the Libim an immense army, and very many chariots and horsemen? Yet, because you relied on the Lord, he delivered them out of your hand. For the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth, and that he may strongly support those who, whose heart is completely his. You have acted foolishly in this. Indeed, from now on, you will surely have wars. Then Asa was angry with the seer and put him in prison. And he was enraged at him for this, and Asa oppressed some of the people at the same time. 
Now the acts of Asa from first to last, behold, they are written in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. In the 39th year of his reign, Asa became diseased in his feet. His disease was severe, yet even in his disease, he did not seek the Lord, but the physicians. So Asa slept with his fathers, having died at the 41st year of his reign. We have to pay very close attention when the chronicler or the writer of Kings or Samuel makes what we call an editorial comment. He's not just quoting what was said, he's not quoting just events, he tells us something about those events. And he tells us, he didn't need to include this as far as the historical record goes, but he tells us in verse 12, he did not seek the Lord even in his disease. So let's just go back over this. Nothing of what the prophet said indicated that Asa was condemned eternally. Nothing about what the prophet said suggested that this was it for Asa. You, you done messed up with, me, with God and therefore you can never serve me again. Nothing about that says that. And Asa's reaction, I think, reveals a lot about him. I think sometimes, maybe the lesson we can draw here is that sometimes we can get so used to being right that when we're, when we're told that maybe we've been in the wrong on something, we don't like it. You can get used to being right so much that you think you're infallible. I'm not saying you intentionally go out there and sin and make mistakes so you, you lower yourself. Don't do that. That's not the permission. But think about it, for 30 some odd years, Asa, we have no record of any rebuke. We have only a record of him doing good. And he makes a mistake. He acts foolishly, the prophet says. Now, instead of acting perhaps like David, who when confronted with his sin, acknowledged it and did what was right and repented of it, Psalm 32 and 51, I believe, those are the two great Psalms of repentance that David writes after the sin with Bathsheba and he's rebuked by Nathan the prophet. What does Asa do? He doesn't literally shoot the messenger, but he shoots the messenger. I don't like what you said. Prison. And you, random, I mean, you think about it. Asa throws these guys, throws the prophet in prison. I bet he's walking down the streets like, hey, Joseph, come here. And just starts like barking orders and starts oppressing some of the people because he's having a temper tantrum. That's what he's having. And we go on a couple years later. Even in, his, I mean, even in this distress, severe illness, some of you deal with neuropathy, neuropathy of the feet or had feet problems. It's not fun. And the text tells us it's severe. And yet, even in his disease, he did not seek the Lord, but the physicians. He continues to rely upon men and not God. Now, that's not to say don't ever consult your physician. But a whole body, a whole approach would be seek God first and your doctor. Asa's not doing the first part. And so unfortunately, Asa failed to end well. I'm going to offer three applications here in addition to the ones I've offered this morning very briefly. The first is there is great value in starting well and building on the right foundation. Asa started very well and built on a great foundation. I mean, think about it. You start your, your reign with removing the idols, removing all this, and commanding the people to seek the Lord their God. That's a good foundation. That's a great foundation. And Asa knew how to listen well and, and obey God. You know, I remember what Jesus said in Matthew 7, verses 24 and 25. Matthew 7, verses 24 through 25. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against that house, and yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. What was the storm that Asa faced? He was outnumbered by the Ethiopians. 
He built on the right foundation, and so he weathered the storm. He sought the Lord his God with all his heart, and he was rewarded for that by giving an oracle a, a word from God, from the prophet. And that only encouraged him to continue on that same path. But as we just talked about, another lesson we learned from this is serving God involves blessings and corrections or rebukes. Being a Christian doesn't mean you're never going to be rebuked by God. In fact, it's a guarantee of it. You know, in Hebrews chapter 12, if you want to turn there real quick, in Hebrews chapter 12, talking about the matter of discipline here, because the letter of Hebrews, why it's a great letter, there's a lot of corrections and chastenings in this letter, such as chapter 5, where he says, by this time you ought to be teachers. Do you think they really liked hearing that? That, hey, I I was expecting more from you by by this point. It's a hard thing to listen to. But in Hebrews chapter 12 here, looking at verse 10, he's continuing on, he's talking about, we had earthly fathers who disciplined us as they saw fit. And verse 10, they disciplined us for a short time as they seemed best to them, but he, referring to God, disciplines us for our good, that we may share in his holiness. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of of righteousness. And what did the Lord say in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 19? He said there to the, to the church at Laodicea, those whom I love I reprove and chasten, therefore be zealous and repent. You know what an unloving parent does? Never corrects their children about bad behavior or bad habits? never tells them the truth they need to hear. God, through the prophet, was telling Asa, you acted foolishly. You need to know that. You trusted a man and not me. Remember back to the Ethiopians? Remember your faith there? Now, to my shame, I remember of the many talks my dad gave me growing up, one I can see clearly in my mind is, I remember we were at Boy Scout camp, and they were telling the story about the old rattled flag, uh, ratted fla- flag, about all it's seen and where it's been. And I remember some friends next to me were talking, and I told them to shh because I was trying to pay attention. It was tr- my dad saw I was showing respect. I remember the week after I got home from camp, I had a moment where I was being a little mouthy to my mom. And my dad took me aside and said, you know that respect you were showing at Boy Scout camp? What happened to that? And boy, did I feel like two inches small when he t- said that to me. Because I'd rather have parents be angry at you instead of saying they're disappointed in you. That just hurts. And really what we're seeing here, I think you're seeing God say to Asa, like, you know, remember how you trusted in me with the Ethiopians? I'm a little disappointed. And Asa did not have to stay in that condition. King David didn't have to stay in his sinful condition with the sin of Bathsheba. He repented of it and he dealt with it. Asa could have done the same thing. But Asa did not handle correction well. And so for us today, when we read a challenging statement in the Bible, when it convicts us of sin or omission of things we're not doing, how do we respond to it? Do we quickly try and get rid of it as fast as possible so we can soothe our conscience? Or do we take a long, hard look at ourselves in the mirror and say, you know, maybe maybe I need to change some things. Maybe I need to do some more things. Maybe I need to correct this this bad behavior I have. And then finally, as we, we've said, finishing well matters just as much as starting out well. You know, Paul, I want to end like Paul. In 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 7, Paul, in some of the last things he wrote to Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 7 here, he said, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course, I have kept the faith. In the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. You know, it's so sad to see Christians, instead of getting more active and more involved when they get older, it's the inverse. 
It's even sour to see when an older Christian fall away. And I don't mean that chronologically in age, but spiritually in age. That I, I don't want to get 10 feet from the finish line and throw in the towel. I want to end my life like Paul did. I want to end my life with my body used up just the way it should have been, tired and nothing left to do. I'm ready to go home. Like a marathon runner. I don't want to have any energy left over, and I don't want to expend it too quickly to where I don't have any energy left to finish the race. It's so sad that somebody who started out so well ends on, at best, a cliffhanger about what happened. But I remind what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, after he reviewed the, the nation that had gone through the Exodus, he said, now these things have been recorded for us, an example to us that we would not be like them. I think in Asa, you both have a Romans 15 forward lessons, encouragement and hope about starting well and listening well. I think you have a 1 Corinthians 10 lesson about how not to end our lives well. So next time we're reading through the Old Testament, let's read with those lenses in mind of what do we learn from it? What, what character traits do I want to emulate here? What character traits do I need to avoid here? Appreciate your attention this morning. You know, every lesson that we preach, it can't be on salvation. But we never want to end a period of time of worship or study without offering the Lord's invitation. If you're here this morning, you've never considered Christ. I know we didn't explicitly preach a lesson about Christ, but Christ was in there. And God's deliverance of Asa from the Ethiopians, we're seeing the gracious work of God. We're seeing salvation in, in, as, a, as a type or a picture. That's what God's offering for you. If you recognize you're in sin, you've done things that are contrary to the will of God, you're a candidate for salvation. Jesus made it very simple for us. Several occasions, I respect your time, so we'll just briefly go over this, but Jesus said that you had to believe that he was God in the flesh, the Christ. They had to repent of your sins. That's changing your mind concerning sin and, and realizing it's not what God wants and I'm going to walk the opposite direction. Confess Christ, as we quote earlier today in Matthew 10, 32 and 33. If you confess Jesus as your Lord before men, he'll confess you. If you deny him, he'll deny you. And Jesus also said in Mark 16, verse 16, that the one who has believed in him and is baptized shall be saved. The one who does not believe shall be condemned. There'll be a moment, there'll be an opportunity in just a moment. If you've never named the name of Christ and put them on the waters of baptism, you can do that this morning. Perhaps you are in sin. Uh, if it's a sin of a private nature, pray to God right now. Make that right before God. Tell him you're sorry, you repent of that sin, and you're asking for his forgiveness. We have that promise in 1 John 1 and verse 9. But if it's a sin of a public nature, it needs to be confessed publicly. And so you can have restitution with your brethren and with the Lord. Maybe you're a Christian that just needs prayer or you want to be identified with the congregation here. You know, in a moment we're going to be sta singing Standing on the Promises. It's a great song. But that's the Christian life. You know, we, the promises of God aren't like the promises of men. Promises of God are never broken. They're sure and steadfast. They're as solid as bedrock. And when you're a Christian, your assurance of salvation, your pardon, that's all based on God's promise. 1 John 1, 9 is a great promise that if we, are, if we confess our sins before him, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. That doesn't change based on how you feel that day. That's always the truth. Just like Mark 16, 16 is always the truth. If we can help you this morning, if we had salvation, prayer, or rest restoration, why don't you come forward as every stand to sing the song that's been selected.